welcome at the official opening of the window. Um, we first have, as you know, the debate. So actually, the idea was to first to make a mini symposium, but then uh, to, to incite some discussion. Actually, we made it more like a debate than, than, a, than a symposium. So there will be very short presentations, five minutes, by um, yeah, a list of quite prominent speakers from the wind engineering community. Um, and so it will be quite strict on time. So I would like to ask all the speakers, so please uh, stick to the, the max five minutes uh, guideline. Uh, and after that, uh, we have uh, two uh, great moderators that will uh, actually guide the debate. And that's uh, Professor Tetzatopoulos is the first one for the first session. And after that, it's Dr. Hassan Himida. Uh, so I would like to start now by inviting Professor Satopoulos here and also the 10 speakers for the first round. Please, uh, you can take your seats and then I will give the word to, or the floor to Professor Satopoulos. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Let me take the time for uh, people to take their seats and uh, say just a few words for that because we are pressed for time as usual. This is not a normal conference or a normal symposium. Uh, first of all, the, the title is quite unique. We talk about uh, good and bad practices in wind tunnel testing. I'm sure you're not going to find in the literature any other title similar to that. But nevertheless, it's quite important and quite uh, uh, challenging, particularly when we are here today when we have the official opening of the uh, atmospheric boundary layer wind tunnel. In, uh, in this university. So, uh, as Bert says, everybody's going to take only five minutes to make a short presentation about a, a central theme, and uh, then we're going to have the most interesting part, which is going to be uh, debate and uh, discussion on some specific questions that, uh, that uh, they have already been prepared. So, without any further delay, I'm going to ask Dr. Thomas Andrian to make the first uh, uh, presentation. He's coming from the University of Liège, Belgium. Well, thank you, Professor Stadopoulos, and uh, good morning, everybody. Here is the statement. Uh, recently, this bridge was built in Turkey. Uh, it's the third Bursphorus bridge uh, on the, uh, uh, just in front of Istanbul. And for the construction of this deck, uh, of this uh, bridge, at the middle of the deck, the deck section were suspended. So they were uh, lifted from the sea level to the deck level, 75 meter high. And the characteristic of that is that the suspension cables uh, for lifting are connected to the main suspension cables of the bridge. So due to that, we, have a wind, uh, we can have a wind effect on such a, on such a structure. And I want to sh uh, share with you how we solve that and how we could improve our solution to solve this uh, this situation. So it's quite big and heavy, and uh, uh, because of that, you can have a very low torsional stiffness. You see here the deck section moving like this. You have a vertical uh, axis torsion. Um, it's very low damped because it's only cable, so you don't have so much friction in them. So you have low damping, low stiffness, and it lasts around seven hours. So during all this time, this deck section can start to oscillate around its torsional uh, around this vertical axis. So how do we model uh, this kind of things in a wind tunnel? We want to model this situation, and we have to downscale it in order to have a 58 meter uh, deck into a 58 centimeter deck in the lab. So if we look at the equation of motion on top, this is the equation of motion of our full scale structure. If we play with the non-dimensional aeroelastic equation here, then we can, evident, we can uh, show all the non-dimensional numbers that you probably all know. So on the left-hand side, you have the equation of, on the structural side. So the mass must be scaled, the damping, the natural frequency, and in, in our case, also the fruit number. So fruit number is important here because we have tension in the cables, and this tension in the cable will give us some stiffness. So this is the tension which is responsible for the stiffness of the deck. So the, the fruit number must be respected on the left-hand side here. And on the right-hand side, you have the aerodynamic force or moment. So you have all the Navier-Stokes equations, and behind the Navier-Stokes equation, you know that you have all these numbers, all the famous guys from the 19th and 20th century, 
of course, Reynolds, fruit if you play with water, not in our case, Weber number, Cauchy number, uh, uh, Euler number, Jensen number, all these numbers uh, which are related to similarity that we have to respect in the wind tunnel. But obviously, because of the scaling, we cannot respect all these similarity together, so we have to make some assumption and we have to choose some of them. In our case, we decided to choose the fruit similarity law because this is the one that gives us the, the stiffness. So for the aerostatic system, this is the most important one. And by doing that, we have to say that we do not Give respect the, the Reynolds number similarity. This is in fact what many people do when we do wind tunnel testing because we have to Give downscale a lot and uh, we cannot avoid that. We also respected the straw relation and mass uh, inertia and damping uh, similarity ratios. Uh, so we end up with, you saw the torsional model, it's a 3D aerodynamic flow, it's a complex fluid structure, fluid structure interaction. So clearly, uh, what do we miss when we have uh, not respected the Reynolds uh, uh, similarity? So my question about that is, what could we do to integrate more CFD to this wind tunnel analysis in order to have a minimiz minimization of the, the, the scaling effect? Okay, so CFD could be used uh, as a, only a fluid part because it's very complex to simulate it as a fluid structure interaction system, but only on the fluid side in order to quantify what is the error we do when we don't scale uh, so much the structure. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. The second speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Jérôme Van Beek from Von Karman Institute, Belgium. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I looked on the, the web and I saw this nice picture of the cyclist standing in the new winter we will see this afternoon. And cyclists do this test because they really want to reduce the wind resistance to go faster. And therefore, they go as close as possible to each other. And I heard Bert speaking, Bert there, yeah, that he will soon replace these cyclists by wind turbines. I find that a, a very good idea. So what you see here is not the drag of 10 cyclists. This is the power uh, delivered or uh, uh, harvested by 10 wind turbines standing in a row offshore, measured and also simulated. And you see already that the second one is uh, getting just 40% less than the first one. And it's, yeah, it's, it goes on like that until the tenth one. So you, this is a real problem. We call this wake losses. This is a real problem in wind farms. So, of course, you want to space them as far as possible from each other to uh, decrease this effect. So my question is, is the TU wind tunnel long enough to put, yeah, 10 cyclists, I understand, but 10 wind turbines? That might be a problem. Well, indeed, it's not a problem. Everyone that has an ABL wind tunnel is doing this, and the solution is, is putting very small wind turbines inside. Then you can put them far away from each other. You see here what we do at Van Karman Institute. You see a three-by-three three wind farm, super small wind turbines. And, of course, the scaling issue is a true issue there. Uh, but what you see here on the left is offshore inflow, so just a flat floor in front, uh, upstream, and on the right, you see onshore inflow, you put some standard roughness, that's standard business in wind engineering, ABL testing. You see then on left bottom, you see what we measure for offshore inflow. We see that the wakes is massively uh, meandering, so very low frequency oscillations. If you do not take these low frequency oscillations into account, the lifetime of your turbines and your entire wind farm will go down. Then on the second picture, this one, that's the wind profile. That's the wind profile measured offshore in the Finomast, Finomast, the German part of the North Sea. And you see it's also not a standard wind engineering wind profile. It has a peak, which is very nice because you get more wind energy. You would like to know where this comes from. This is, uh, we call this a low level jet. It's really a thermal effect. During springtime, the water is very cold, warm air is coming in, so it's very uh, stably stratified flow, and this gives this low-level jet very good for getting more uh, wind uh, power. But to do that in a, a wind tunnel, you have to put these thermal effects into account, 
That's uh, not so easy. They do that in England, in uh, Lausanne. There are some wind tunnels. In the, in the, uh, where do you do that? You have to heat and cool the uh, wind tunnel walls. We do that at VKI by injecting a cold cloud. Then you can do the same. Here you see how we do that. Here you see this wind tunnel. It's not a closed loop wind tunnel. We inject the cloud, and uh, then the cloud is ejected to the atmosphere. Uh, in, a, uh, in a closed loop wind tunnel, I think this is more difficult. You also see some waves there. I think yeah, we are going to put waves in this wind tunnel to see the effect of the waves on the wind profile. There are very old Charnock relationships from 1955, which have to be reviewed uh, for, for the offshore wind energy. And the last issue I want to address is icing. Icing is a major issue. As soon as one blade or two blades has ice, you get an imbalance, so the lifetime of your uh, wind farm or wind turbine goes down. So you have to stop these wind turbines then. 20% of the wind energy is lost uh, because you have to stop these wind turbines. Not only in Norway, this goes until uh, Turkey. We have a dedicated icing wind tunnel, as you see on the right. I wonder why you cannot integrate it somehow in an AVL wind tunnel. So what industry wants is to predict the lifetime of wind turbines and to extend the lifetime. And they want also the same for the power, to predict the power they will have and to extend, to increase this power. This relates to, like I said, icing, stratified inflow, waves and wakes. Maybe the wave operation of a wind turbine could be uh, optimized. And what about seabed erosion, floating structures, fatigue and erosion by uh, salt, air salt, uh, seawater, uh, my question, my intriguing question is, what is the role of an atmospheric boundary layer within all those issues? With that, I would like to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Zaron. The next speaker is Professor Dr. Vincent Denuel from University of Liège, Liège Belgium. Thank you, Ted, for this nice uh, introduction. Thank you, Bert, for inviting. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm here to talk about good and bad practices in, uh, in wind tunnel testing, uh, but the title of the talk is Air Elastic Modeling of Bridge Decks. So uh, it's kind of difficult to talk about modeling at the same time as uh, wind tunnel testing. So I'm trying to combine both and uh, well, address this issue in the, in the case of, uh, of a bridge, uh, bridge design. Uh, this picture is just a, uh, a representation of the, the, the span of bridges that have been constructed over the last years. Uh, and together with the span, you, what you see here is the year of construction. And uh, of course, the upper envelope that is over there is just uh, the records. Uh, every time there's a new record, the envelope grows. And uh, what this picture just uh, suggests is that uh, in the future, we have, uh, again, many, many more uh, large span bridges to, uh, to expect. Uh, we all know this famous project of the Messina Straits, and uh, there are similar projects with uh, 3,000 spans in, uh, in Indonesia. And uh, so I think uh, sooner or later this curve will definitely go out of this uh, slide. And so it calls for uh, uh, a question that I would like to address here is uh, 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 basically about the models that we use. So this is a famous model that is used for bridge techs. Uh, it's basically a sum of three terms. So we have uh, LS, SE, and LB over, over here. Uh, they are just uh, specified over here for the lift uh, force, but we have the same for the drag and, uh, and for, the, for, the, for the moment, for the pitching moment. Um, and these forces, they have, been, um, they have been addressed with different theories over the last decades. So static forces have been known for a while. Then uh, we have uh, self-excited forces, which are used for flutter analysis today. Uh, they go down to Scanlan's works, uh, 1960s. And the buffeting forces, which are related to the turbulence or to the fact that the, the wind that is coming on the, on the bridge deck is, uh, is uh, somehow stochastic, usually the, uh, attributed to the works of Davenport. Um, just examples here at the bottom of the slides show some equations that some of you might recognize. And just what I would like to point out here, and this is, uh, this is maybe the, the question of today, is, uh, is related to the fact that we consider that the forces of, on, on bridge decks is just a sum of terms. So is there any good reason why we just took the works of those guys and add forces, and somehow we always neglect interactions between them? So you see here, we just have a sum. And usually what is also done is that we linearize the forces, because we use as engineers to work with a linear system theory, which is something that is very known. 
and which we, with which we are very comfortable. We can compute critical uh, wind speed. And so typically, uh, the expressions that we have over here, although they are a bit more involved at, in their very first and seminal format, they still remain linear. And so the question is, uh, is basically, well, is there anything else, anything better we need to do? And uh, if you look at the literature over the last, I would say, two decades, uh, I've checked uh, papers published in the uh, very good uh, international journal for wind engineering. And over the last, uh, the last decades, you see more and more papers dealing with nonlinear loading models. Um, so, which means that definitely there's room for something else. And uh, in terms of bad and good practices, uh, some people are used to oppose two things, uh, basically the time domain approach and the frequency domain approach, which is also known as spectral approach. And this is typically valid for the buffeting analysis. And uh, I've just taken an example here with a few uh, the most important features of each uh, type of, uh, of approach. So in terms of a uh, uh, time domain approach, uh, well, definitely we know that we are able with that kind of approach to, to deal with nonlinearities in, uh, in the structural behavior or even in the loading. That's very easy to do. Uh, well, we need to pay attention to transient regimes uh, because uh, there's always a transient regime that usually we want to get rid of. So. Uh, that, that's in the, in the bad practices, so we shouldn't forget, forget that. It's very simple to implement. Uh, it might be a little bit tricky if we want to generate large wind speeds, uh, large wind fields, uh, sorry. And uh, we also need to pay attention to the design uh, or extreme values that, that we take into consideration. So it's not just enough to take one window, one simulation, and consider extreme values out of that. Um, on the opposite, uh, well, this is a word I shouldn't use, but anyway, on the opposite, um, in the frequency domain, uh, we have something that is uh, usually quite simple because it's based on model analysis, which means that the structure, uh, the structural response is decomposed into different modes, which are then recombined using uh, somehow some coupling. Uh, it is possible, although this is not common, uh, commonly thought, that nonlinearities and non-Gaussianities might be accounted for in this uh, frequency uh, domain. So as you see, these are definitely two different uh, approaches. I don't want to say which one is good, which one is bad, although I have my own opinion on that, but definitely they should be combined and definitely they are complementary because one provides a very simple understanding of what's happening while the other usually is considered as being more, uh, much more uh, improved and, and involved. And uh, well, my belief is that any, any, any study that we do should combine, should combine both. All right, so I would like now to, uh, to connect uh, these things together with a wind tunnel experiment. So how can we start this? All right, so this is a video uh, that was made by NTNU about the, uh, the last uh, test rig that they have. And so uh, what they did over here, I, I'm not pretty sure this is, this is on purpose, but uh, I, fi I find it quite interesting that the test rig that they have is, uh, is quite similar to what we know. So it's able to, uh, to measure three components of forces on bridge decks uh, under different kind of vibrations. So you see here pitching, twisting, and heaving, uh, which are the three independent motion of a bridge deck that can be typically imposed. But what they can also do here, you see they can simulate three degrees of freedom motion, and they also can connect it quite well to uh, so, some uh, response spectrum. Uh, they can also replicate some random motion, so this is a white noise, okay, constant spectrum, and they can also replicate buffeting responses. Is it done on purpose or not? Uh, I don't know, but definitely uh, what we can say based on that is this is the best uh, tool to check whether or not linearity is, is fine, because if we just uh, stick ourselves to the usual test that we do in the wind tunnel, then we rely on linearity and additivity then after to compute the whole response of a bridge deck. All right, while doing these kind of tests, um, the question is directly addressed. Okay, so this is my intriguing question of today. I would be very happy to uh, elaborate a bit more on that later today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Olivier Flamand from the CSTB, Science uh, Scientific and Technique du Batiment, Nantes, is the next speaker. Olivier. Good morning to anyone. Is it coming? Yeah. So my talk is about uh, high-rise buildings. I mean uh, towers. Do you have an example of a tower here? All these uh, skyscrapers are vertically standing. You have an example of uh, one in Russia here, Strasbourg. 
And uh, because they are vertically standing, they are subject to wind loads. And what is important to, to represent here is that the wind loads are not correlated all along the vertical line of the, the building. And this is uh, the usual way to represent that, is to use a boundary layer wind tunnel in which we reproduce this uh, spatial correlation of the, the wind eddies. And um, the classical way to do that is to build, as you can see, a model in the wind tunnel that you, you <laughs> equipped with uh, pressure taps, dozens of pressure taps here. And what is uh, important to reproduce in wind tunnel is the extreme loads, the peak loads. And actually, this can be done by other ways, but the boundary layer wind tunnel is today the best way to reproduce that, I think. Um, I will be giving examples here shortly. And um, what is important also is not only the wind, but the surroundings. And when you build such an experiment, you have to reproduce around the envi environment. And you can see here the other towers that are built in the wind tunnel. And you can see the rear, the roughnesses that are used to model the wind and to make the, ba the boundary layer and the turbulent wind. And I will give you an example of uh, what it gives uh, as a fluctuation of the wind. You can see that the eddies are small compared to the size of the building itself. And I will uh, make a special focus on uh, what is up to date. Is it coming? Yeah, today's requirements in boundary layer wind tunnel. So for um, such a case, we have uh, four or 500 pressure taps, synchronous. So uh, bad thing will, have to, will be to have uh, non-synchronous pressure taps, of course. Uh, you can have uh, 1,000, we have 1,000 in our system. It is important also to have a stiff balance at the bottom of the model in order to measure the mean loads and to compare it with the integration of the pressure taps. It is also important to, to measure the, the wind field, and so it's nice to use PIV to make slices and to see how the wind speed is uh, modeled around the, the model itself. And finally, if you want to make a local measurement of the fluctuating pressure, it is nice to use hot wire anemometers or multi-hole pressure props that are very common to do that. So this is a today's requirement of normal boundary layer, layer wind tunnel. And this is a small... <laughs> I hope the sound can go down a bit just to explain how it works in normal life in Banari Layer Wind Tunnel because every day is going with a, a new project. So it is very important to check measurements at any step. And this is a, the good way to do, you know. So you check your model, you check the way you assemble the various things in your model, and also you can have, we just recently bought a um, 3D scanner to assess the place, the location of each element of the, of the model. Also, you have to check here every pressure tap. So when you have 500, you have to check they all work correctly. And also that you look at the time signal to be sure no tube is bent. And also you check here any, at any step, you have to check, you have to check. Even if the wind tunnel is quite old, you can see that. We can also introduce new tools like CFD. We can use CFD for replacing the pressure taps before the test and when designing the model. And also at the end, uh, when looking at the results, because we don't see anything in the wind tunnel, it's very useful to have CFD also to, to show us, same way as we can do with PIV, to show us the flow and to understand what is happening to the model. So the final question I will ask is, what can we do for articulation of the CFD with the wind tunnel? That is a physical representation of uh, the problem. What is the place of the CFD with, along, close to the, to the physical modeling of the wind tunnel? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olivier. Dr. Chris Gert from TNO, Netherlands, is the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've chosen a different view here in this presentation because I like to uh, address the view of the end user. 
of the people that actually use the results from Rintel. We've seen a lot of uh, aerodynamics, and I, I'm quite sure we will see a lot of aerodynamics uh, this day. I don't have it here. So I'm talking about guidelines. Um, maybe this, the, the, the upper right text there is a text which comes from the Eurocode on wind loads. So in Europe, we have this Eurocode, and the Eurocode on wind loads gives, you, gives some, uh, some room for using wind tunnel results. But what the Eurocode says, you have to use appropriate models. If I ask every one of you what is an appropriate model, I probably get different answers from every one of you. So um, we all know what our appropriate model is, but we all give different answers. What should the end user do with it? Um, also, uh, I think that uh, that little cartoon uh, says it. There is a difference between what the wind tunnel people offer you and what the structural engineer in this case wants. And do we speak the same language? We probably don't speak the same language, but how can we then translate the results from the one as an input for the other? That's really the, the, uh, the important. And of course, there are some uh, guidelines already uh, in the world, and I have uh, four uh, title pages of uh, American, a Canadian one in uh, in-house standard. There is a German one on the way, which I have there, and there is the Dutch one, uh, which is the uh, at the left-hand side with Kerr on top of it. And we have uh, worked on that one, on the Dutch one, which is now already uh, some 10 years ago, because we had these, these problems. And one, one uh, example of a project where we saw that the results of the wind tunnel work did not actually end up at the desk of the people that want to use is this one. This is a project near Schiphol where uh, 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 this building here, I think this building, also the other buildings, they were new designed. And apart from a wind comfort study, because the pictures from a wind comfort study, also the pressures have been measured on the facade of that building. Um, of course, obviously, to establish the wind loads. The building wasn't even occupied, but then this happened. So on this actually building, actually, some positions were about the same as the one that we did in the wind tunnel. The facade panels came off. The building was situated next to the railway station, so there the, the could, no, the could be no trains anymore. It was, it was very dangerous outside. So there was a huge uh, problem there. What we found out when we were asked to say something about this damage is that the people that designed the facade didn't even see the wind tunnel results. What does it have to do with wind tunnel guidelines? Well, the wind tunnel tests were done uh, according to the state-of-the-art way that we do it, and it was actually delivered to the, to the people that, uh, that, that asked for it. And, but the people that asked for it didn't even realize that they should give this report to the facade uh, engineer so that he could uh, actually use those numbers to design his facade. We solved the problem, obviously, because the building is still there and no damage has occurred at, at, at that time, but it cost a lot of money afterwards. And apart from raising a question, because if I would raise a question here, I would have the answer immediately and say, well, I have, have a statement here. If you look at the guidelines for internal testing, I think all of the guidelines for internal testing, they do really, uh, sorry, I put the wrong one button. They all, they all say something about how to set up a wind tunnel experiment. What kind of scaling parameters would you use? How to scale, how to scale the turbulence, how to scale the profile, et cetera, et cetera. They say something about how to perform, how to execute wind tunnel uh, tests. But what is really something which is lacking in all of these uh, wind tunnel guidelines, some guidelines have some, some, uh, uh, some guidance, but not really rules, is how do we actually analyze wind tunnel results? You measure a pressure, but what do you do with it? A mean pressure is something different than a peak pressure, but the structural engineer doesn't know. So there's also a, a last one which, which deals with reporting. We should be transparent about what we do, and we should be transparent to the structural engineer to what exactly he can do with the results. So we need uh, there are some demands for, for reporting. So that would be my, I say, plea for, for all people that work with Wintunnel. Be transparent towards the end user about the results that you have gained. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Chris. Uh, is uh, Rudiger Heffer here? Yes, he arrived. He's probably stuck in traffic somewhere. So we're going to go to the next one, Professor Dr. Alan Robbins from University of Surrey in the UK, who's going to give us the next talk. Good morning, everyone. Um, talk about something a little bit different. Right. That's a very old picture of me. I'm sorry about that. 
Um, I want to talk about something a little bit different, which is, I suppose as we get older, we get more involved in managing of these things rather than the science that goes on in them. And if you spent a lot of money on building a wind tunnel facility, as they've done here, for example, and as we have done, uh, there are 24 hours in a day, so why don't you run it for 24 hours in a day? But you don't want your staff to be there overnight, so very quickly you get to the point of wanting to run the tunnel unmanned. And it's then what leads on from that. And this also touches on something that's happened in the UK. We now have something called the National Wind Tunnel Facility. It's a group of university facilities that have been picked out, if you like, to, to receive special funding so they can be, as it says, state-of-the-art in terms of the equipment they have and the capability they have. And there are a number of universities. And you can see the various targets of doing this in, in the present, in, in the slide. Um, now, remote access to these, of course, starts to offer a wider capability because people, even in a country as small as the UK or as small as the Netherlands, people don't necessarily want to travel from one place to another to do their experiments. It's expensive. So why not indeed have the ability to operate them remotely? That should also enhance the extent to which a national facility is used. So if we look at what it's involved, we, as I say, we got to this because we wanted to run the tunnel overnight when we were not there. Those are all the things, or those, as I look at them, and that's as you look at them, they're all the things that you have to build in to control so that you can do that. So these can operate without anybody being present for, say, 12, 15 hours. Uh, and very soon, of course, you realize, I'd actually like to know what's going on when I'm at home. So the first thing you do is you get the control system to send you text messages, and you hope you get the one that just says run complete. But it may not, there may be an issue, or something might have crashed. Then you think, oh, well actually I'd like to be able to put that right from home. And very, so very quickly you go from, being, from having a facility that you can run unmanned to one that you can run remotely. And in our case, the longest we've run it remotely is three days. In the UK, and perhaps as much the same in the Netherlands, if you get the slightest amount of snow, everything stops. And the university was closed, and uh, people couldn't get in. For, and for three days, we carried on doing the experiment until something physically fell over and you actually needed a person present. But all those systems can be automated. Important ones are, there are safety systems, bottom right corner. So that if something catastrophically goes wrong, everything closes down safely and that you cannot restart from the computer automatically from that state. There has to be people present. Data, automatic data archiving can be built into this, um, and you can then, of course, access the information from wherever you are. And once you can do that from your office, you can do it from anywhere, and then you really are using the facility efficiently. So that's the hardware you're controlling. That happens to be our case. And in our case, we've developed all the software ourselves, and it's, it's a LabVIEW open source code. We're quite happy for other people to use it. And I, as I say, it can run all the features of our tunnel, which is a stratified flow tunnel, for a long period of time, totally unmanned. The challenges of that, of course, and linked to the challenges of having national centers, and our wind tunnel is one of those, is that how do you maintain national expertise that's spread around? How do you avoid there being a, a, uh, an attitude of losers and winners, a mental mentality of looking at things that way? I didn't get included in the group. Well, okay, there's probably a good reason. It doesn't, what we've got to get to is the point where people don't actually think that way. They think, well, the tunnel I need to use is there. I'm going to use it. I'm here, but I can run it from here. So I need to do one visit, get everything set up, and then I can run my experiments remotely. And how efficient that is. And if I can run them 24 hours a day. These are expensive assets. It's like aircraft. You don't earn money when they're sitting on the ground doing nothing. And likewise with a wind tunnel, you don't earn money when it's not running. So get as many hours in the day out of the tunnel as you can. So my question then is just that. Is remote operation the future for wind tunnel work? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to continue to the end, and then we're going to go back to Rudiger, who was uh, 
a little bit late. Okay, to avoid problems with the slide sequence. So, Eddie Williamson from uh, the Netherlands is going to be the next speaker. Hey, good morning. My presentation is about the Dutch standard on wind comfort and wind danger in the built environment. It was published in 2006 and it had a running time of about uh, nine years to uh, get to the end. Um, a lot of people were involved and uh, contributed to this, uh, uh, to this standard. It's not a legal building requirement, but it is applicable in private law and negotiations. It is based on existing practice in the Netherlands at that time and extensive open literature survey. It describes also when effect from wind uh, needs to be investigated regarding comfort and danger. And it also provides an assessment protocol and quality demands. To get to the answer to the assessment, uh, it, uh, it uses also a uh, software package which was uh, developed by the Royal Netherlands Institute of Meteorology, Meteorology uh, something like that. <laughs> uh, a spin-off from the Hydra project on wind climate assessment. It uses uh, surface roughness data from satellite images with a resolution of 25 meters and uh, wind data from 51 uh, gun stations in the Netherlands uh, over a period of 40 years. This is an example, uh, you don't read, have to read all the numbers, it's uh, just an example of the effect from uh, the software package. You put in just the uh, coordinates of the urban plan and you get uh, a table with wind speed data in steps of uh, uh, one meter per second uh, for wind directions uh, with a step size of 30 degrees. And that, those data are used to get uh, to the assessment uh, later on. Um. The assessment uh, table in uh, the Dutch standard uh, gives uh, some uh, probability uh, numbers uh, for different uh, wind uh, classes. We have wind classes A to E. Uh, when, uh, in, when a threshold wind speed of five meters per second is uh, exceeded uh, in less than two and a half percent of time, we have grade A. When the probability of exceedance uh, lies between two and a half and five percent, we have an B, and, and so on until an E. So we uh, is going from smooth to very wild uh, environment, you might say. There are three activity areas defined, brisk walking, lounging, and sitting and standing. And when you have uh, wind class A, then uh, for all three categories, uh, the wind climate is considered to be good. If you have a grade B, then uh, sitting and standing becomes moderate, and the other two activity areas are still good. When you have C, then uh, lounging becomes moderate, uh, sitting and standing becomes uh, poor, and bridge walking becomes good, and so on, until E, where everything is uh, poor. For wind danger, you have a threshold velocity of 15 meters per second, and when you ha have a probability of exceedance between 0.05 and 0.3 percent, then it's considered to be limited risk. And when it's larger than 0.3%, then it's considered to be dangerous. So what we need is to get to those uh, probability of exceedance uh, values. So you do an experiment, can be in a wind tunnel, can be uh, in a CFD, and you find uh, values, wind speed ratios between the local wind speed and the wind speed at a height of 60 meter. That is wind direction dependent. And the model law says that that ratio is the same as in uh, the wind tunnel as in full scale condition. So if you combine those two uh, simple equations, you get a result that uh, the full scale wind speed is, uh, is uh, 
reached by multiplication of the wind speed ratio determined in wind tunnel or CFD with the full scale 60 meter uh, wind speed. Well, that 60 meter height wind speed full scale comes from that software package. So if you put it into those wind tunnel results, then you end up with the probability of exceedance values which you were looking for, and you end up with the assessment of the pedestrian level wind conditions. So that brings me also to the fifth and last slide, uh, good and bad practices. I just want to focus on the good practice. Uh, for me, it's quality first, and uh, also be critical at all times about uh, quality, you might look at the model, what about building details, what about the details of the local environment, trees, bushes, and so on. Uh, the actual wind speed measurements, or if you use CFD, the calculations, the sensitivity of the sensors to, uh, to other things than only wind speed, eh? uh, flow angle, uh, horizontal, vertical, flow turbulence, flow temperatures, you have to deal with it. And also the simulated atmospheric boundary layer. The wind speed ratio is between the ground level wind speed and 60 meter height wind speed. So your profile should be okay. In the wind tunnel is normally one, maybe two profiles. In reality, you have a lot of different profiles when the wind direction is changing. So there you have to deal with that also. Uh, about being critical, uh, yeah, for me is being critical something that should be done from the start until the end. The start, it starts with people, uh, staff, uh, be critical, uh, wind tunnel, uh, you have the calibrations, uh, maybe not so stable as you uh, thought it would be. You have your instruments, you should be critical, you have your software, and finally you should also uh, be critical on your results. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Professor Dr. Bas van der Wiel from uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands is the next speaker. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, first, uh, congratulate uh, Bert uh, with your magnificent uh, infrastructure. Uh, it should be said, I think, today. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, but you asked me to give a critical note. Eh? So uh, I will try to give a critical note. And knowing that, uh, unlike the one of Jeroen and of Alan, your wind tunnel doesn't have stratification at the moment, uh, I would like to uh, make a critical note on that. Um, so what we see in the back is a, uh, a, a, a simulation uh, of a weather forecast with turbulence resolving techniques uh, made by the company Wiffle. If you want more information, I can give it you later. So there's a, a source uh, at the surface over here. And you see that it's quite a complex uh, situation. It's a real situation, real weather. Huh? And you see that the source is more or less indecisive to go to the left or to the right, a bit like typical government. Um, so let's go into that uh, in more depth. What does uh, stratification mean in the atmosphere and what impact does it have? So on daytime, the sun heats the earth, right? And uh, the air becomes warm and light and will rise, yeah? just like that. But at night, the physics is completely different. Eh? Uh, at night time, there is long wave radiative cooling of the surface. We get cold and dense air, and the air is reluctant to mix. So you need a strong wind shear to mix. And if that is not present, uh, then we will see, for example, a nice sticky fog layer. And you will agree with me that this is a first order uh, big difference. So it's not something that can easily be ignored in these situations. So let's go to a second case, and my assistant Fernandez will uh, switch on the, uh, the movie. So this is an afternoon case with a, a pollutant dispersion in a, in a nice uh, August day, uh, during the afternoon, and you have to add two hours to have the real time in the Netherlands. Um, and then later in the afternoon, towards the evening, we will see that the plume is getting more stably stratified 
and will not uh, dilute uh, anymore. So you can be, uh, imagine also being a cyclist, would you start in the noon or late in the afternoon, eh? uh, as being, uh, let's say, Tom Dumoulin, right? Um, so uh, this is also true, this type of effects, for, for example, for wakes in wind tunnels, and we know that. So there's a student, uh, Pim van Dorp in, uh, in Delft, he did simulations on the wakes of wind turbines, and he saw, and comparable to many uh, other results in literature, for example, by a colleague of him, uh, that the wake recovery is strongly a function of stability. Of course, during daytime, you have strong convection, so strong interaction of momentum, so the wake can recover very fast behind the wind turbine. Whereas during nighttime, or unstable uh, conditions, just as Jeroen showed, then the wake cannot recover that fast. So to know the yield of a wind uh, turbine park, you have to convolute it with real weather over a full year, let's say. Yeah, so that is that are important effect that cannot easily be ignored. Um, so the same thing is for simulations of pollutants in, 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 in cities. Uh, so I won't repeat that. So the only thing I want to call upon is the, that you think in your application, can we extend the results from a wind tunnel to the real atmosphere? Or is it more complex, right? So for a storm case, of course, you can extend because it's a neutral flow. But there are other things that might require more uh, thinking. Yeah? Uh, actually, I, I also gave a thesis for the second uh, session, but probably it will be ignored. It's about javelin throwing. Um, in any case, we have to attack the problem from multiple sides. Eh? So combining different types of wind tunnels, CFDs, hardcore fundamental modeling, and applied modeling in a way to, to really attack our prey, just like those guys do. And with that, I would like to close. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going here to Professor Dr. Rudiger Heffer from uh, Ruhr University, Bochum, Germany, to be the last uh, presenter. And uh, I would like the slide person to go backwards to make this presentation. Good. It works. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm here to give a short uh, insight into, as we think, good practice in, uh, in the wind tunnel. I must really say uh, this morning I was late because what, regarding the streets, what we do in Germany is a brutal practice. Maybe you saw already the uh, concentration of traffic jams around North Rhine-Westphalia and I experienced it this morning very nicely um, and uh, had the idea, how to do this, had the idea to uh, bring something about bridges, but uh, today's lecture or short remarks are on aerodynamic damping and vortex resonance of uh, uh, chimneys. Uh, what we can see here is um, a little investigation on uh, the structural response on slender structures due to vortex excitation. And uh, there we all know there are two big models um, in, in the Eurocode. Uh, model number one is uh, from Professor Rushuwai, and model number two is a more um, older one from uh, Barry Vickery and uh, co-workers. And uh, the main difference between these both models is that the one is of intensive practical use and the other one is of more scientific use. The scientific use is dedicated to the point that here Turbulence intensity, for example, and Reynolds number play really a role, are explicitly part of that model, which is not the case in the uh, model number one, uh, which on the other hand uh, has been validated and calibrated to practical uh, cases. So what we can see here is uh, just um, a description of the structural response according to the Eurocode, where we can see that uh, the standard deviation of the response in a reduced way, shown here in a reduced way, depends of course on damping and we find damping um, here given as uh, the scrutin number which is structural damping and a yellow part which is aerodynamic damping and this part, this aerodynamic damping is a decisive one. 
If you look at the graph, then you see that uh, the model after Vickery is one which carries a strong nonlinearity in it, and the nonlinear part of aerodynamic damping is the one that makes vortex resonance working and acting. Now, in our wind tunnel investigation, to our big surprise, we found a different uh, course of the graph uh, when uh, increasing the um, uh, standard deviation of the response. And we found out that the nonlinear part, obviously, is not that dominant as in uh, Vickery's model. And that made us very curious on the outcome, aiming on practical use of this scientific model. Well, the next part. Uh, shows us um, a short part of the experiment. This wind tunnel was uh, planned and directed by Professor Niemann, who, by the way, sends his best regards to you. This morning at 6.15, he called me by phone and told me that he feels not very well. I hope very much this is just a short breakdown of the, due to a cold. And um, he was the one to construct this wind tunnel in the 70s, and that wind tunnel was uh, built to, uh, explicitly for building aerodynamics. We improved it more and more, and today it has also a little installation that moves uh, slender models in a decisive way in a forced motion mechanisms up and down. And uh, by that mechanism, together with the uh, force measurements and the pressure measurements with that which are possible, we can also directly generate our aeroelastic mechanisms and uh, investigate them with a higher accuracy. The lower picture shows the situation when a slender structure, here it is a circular cross-section, is moved in the wind tunnel, like a locomotive going up and down, and uh, we are able there to identify the phases between the generated elastic forces and the movement. And this phases is a measure, of course, a very detailed measure of the uh, aerodynamic damping. So this is the first part. Having a good tool in hand, as here in Eindhoven will be inaugurated today. And the other part is to transferring that into practical application. And there the decisive thing is, as I think, validation. Validation, I think, um, has a potential that brings us, uh, apart from just tuning screws in models, but making the models right. I think this is the decisive step. And uh, what we can see here is that we just want to give a proof of that by showing this table on the left lowest part. In the left lower part, we have 27 uh, measured oscillations of chimneys from engineering practice, from executed buildings, many of them also measured by TNO, some of them measured by Ruschewa in Aachen from all over the world, from Denmark, measured by Svend Ole Hansen and co-workers. And uh, when now, using the new model where we think we have a better idea about the aerodynamic damping, about the nonlinear part with provoking resonance, then we have a very nice um, prediction for full-scale cases here. And that is in quality even better as model number one in the Eurocode, which was exclusively dedicated for practical application. And it makes use of the basic foundings made by Vickery, namely that turbulence intensity plays a big role and that Reynolds number play a big role, which everybody would believe immediately when studying that course. So here we have a direct comparison. The already uh, accepted Vickery model gives us an estimation, a quite conservative one, and when improving that by new types of experimentation in boundary layer wind tunnels and validation, we have even an improved estimate of the uh, resonant oscillations. The next step will, short, will surely be now a transfer to practical application into the, in the code. As you know, in the moment, the project teams for the Eurocode are ongoing. Tomorrow we have in Bochum an invitation to uh, some people of the project team to discuss with them about new models that we could put there. And this is a small example that I, would, that I wanted to show you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudiger. Well, now we are going to go to the second and more exciting, perhaps, uh, part of uh, 
our symposium this morning. This is, of course, as you have seen in the program, the first part dealing with uh, structures and energy, and this will be followed by the second part on environment and, and sports. We're doing very well in terms of time because we started a little bit late, and we have until 10.45 for the debate. 10.45 we're going to have, we have been promised that it's going to be a coffee break, and then preparation for the second part of the, of the uh, symposium. So I would like first to thank all the panelists for keeping the time and for making very interesting presentations. So now let's see what's going to be the most effective way to go forward. We want your participation. So far you have been passive. Now you have to be active. And you can be active in different ways. One way is if you know the answer to any of these questions, please I mean, you know, get up and give us the answer and then see what's going to be the reaction of the panelists. There are microphones here, so you don't have to uh, you know, get up yourself so you can answer the questions or you may comment on that. Um, you may want to comment on these questions or on the presentations that uh, we had, the short presentations that we had here, as you feel like it. And then we'll see how we're going to move from, let's say, you know, the one area to the other area, depending on the, on the interest that we demonstrate. And maybe to kind of, you know, break the ice, as they say, I'm going to start with a question which is quite similar or quite kind of, you know, applicable to most of these presentations, and I'll tell you why I pose this question in a more direct way than what we heard it before. And this is the question about geometric scaling in the wind tunnel. Now, the reason that I'm selecting to start with that, start the debate with this question, is because this question is very timely. Uh, I see, as being the editor of a journal, I see more and more and more papers coming up dealing with wind tunnel testing, and literally, authors have... Uh, dragged over the years, and they don't pay any attention to the scale at all. Now, how significant this is, or this might be, depending on the kind of experiment and so on, I leave it up to you. But in the past, I remember the papers were very uh, precise in, in, in explaining why the geometric scale is so and so. Uh, now, the only thing they do is they mention that the geometric scale was 1 to 40 or whatever, and uh, we keep going, and these are the results. Uh, of course, that generates questions from the reviewers and back and forth and major revisions, etc., etc. So, the question is the importance of the geometric scaling, how important it is, and the question is for the panelists that they addressed already that indirectly, and for the audience as well. Who would like to go first? Nobody. <laughs> well, you won't start, okay, so you'll be second. Okay. Live? Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, how do we do it? It's, I mean, our, our work is quite different. A lot of what has been talked about today is to do with structural loading and so on. Our work is wind flow and uh, dispersion mainly. So we want to produce, we want to make measurements that, are, that we can spatially resolve with our instrumentation adequately, whatever that may mean. But that means we might want to measure at the equivalent of pedestrian height the equivalent of two meters above the ground, say, or very close to a source. So that drives us to have the largest model that we might be able to accommodate. On the other hand, the wind tunnel is only one and a half meters tall, so our boundary layer is of order a meter tall. And as we make the model larger, the scale that we're operating, or the boundary layer we're effectively simulating, is getting shallower and shallower so that turbulent scales are becoming too small relative to the model, and there's nothing we can do about that. So it's a compromise between those two things. We are aware that the turbulence, when you get into the upper part of the boundary layer, the scales are too small, the intensities may be right, but the profile is too shallow. But we are faced with the fact that that is a compromise we have to live with, and we have to understand through perhaps doing some CFD work or models at different scales. Sometimes we've done that. We've done we've run experiments at two scales to demonstrate that the scaling, that the pure geometrical scaling didn't affect the results. That's quite rare because it's a, it's a complicated process. But it's worth doing once in a while to check that the procedures you use as a matter of course in your laboratory are actually justified. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's an interesting comment, so that may generate additional discussion. Uh, Alberto, also, you had, you want to introduce yourself first? 
microphone? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Alberto Zasso from uh, Polytechnic Milano Wind Tunnel. So I am the director of uh, Polytechnic Wind Tunnel that is extremely large, so it should be very easy for me to say the, the larger is the scaling, the better is the test. But uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that the point of the scaling is a great, is a really a, a relevant, but uh, it is going to address the point of uh, what is relevant for the wind tunnel testing. And so the example uh, that uh, Van Beek uh, gave on the wind turbines uh, is uh, uh, extremely interesting because uh, uh, we cannot scale the wind turbines uh, making wind tunnel testing. And we are doing a lot of wind tunnel testing for wind turbines. We are running, for example, a Horizon 2020 project on uh, uh, control of wind farms where we are the purpose of that is to make comparisons among the numerical simulation and what we are get getting from the uh, experiments. And so this is uh, the point. The point is that uh, what we can do in the, the wind tunnel, for example, for uh, wind turbines, uh, is uh, to address uh, a situation where we know the boundaries, we know the boundary condition very well, we have in our hands the modeling of the object. We have the modeling of the wind turbine. We know which are the characteristics of the blades because we, we, we have our, those blades in our hands. So that what we can do, we can compare the numerical modeling that we are running with the experiment that we are doing. This comparison, this validation of the modeling is, um, is in our hands and this is very valuable. For sure, of course, uh, uh, it, it is a multi-scale problem. So all the problems that we are dealing with are multi-scale and we have to, to take into account of that. And for sure, if we are addressing a neutral uh, turbulence, a, new, a neutral boundary layer, it is not possible to do at the same time what is stratified. So the point is, my, in my opinion, we are not doing a wind tunnel test that is working for everything. We are dealing with something that is very specific and that is the tool to be used for validating the numerical modeling. This is my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, any reaction? Agreements, disagreements? Yes, yeah, not much to say on that. I think it was a very good comment. So I showed these very small turbines that everyone is doing, and how much this represents a real turbine, no one knows so far. And actually, it's, it's, it's because when you have a building, you have a sharp edge, and then the scaling doesn't matter so much. But a wind turbine, everything is round. So the status of the boundary layer is very important. And how this is affected by the incoming turbulence, intensity, and the length scales, it's unknown. So we can compute this, and then we need to validate this in the wind tunnel. But it's still a long work there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, OK, please, uh, and then. Um, I hear the word validation. I hear the word numerical. I hear wind tunnels. Um, <laughs> but we're all dealing with real life conditions. And what I think is what's lacking um, still is good full scale verification measurements, which we all can use as a reference, uh, as a quality check of our model scale experiments. A lot of work has been done in the past about that. There are a lot of troubles also with full scale measurements. Uh, we know that, I think I know that. But still, we need uh, such uh, experimental validation experiments which are made available for others to use as quality checks for their wind tunnel work. So the one-to-one -one scale is, is very important. Yeah, I think everybody would agree with that. Okay. Uh, uh, I think Rudiger first and Marina. And I, then I can make my contribution short. It is exactly what I wanted to say. What we need is full-scale measure. I remember the time when uh, the uh, wind tunnel in Bochum was set up for cooling towers. Actually, this wind tunnel was built for cooling towers, and uh, it was a decisive step forward to have, to have cooling tower measurements, which were done also by our group in that time. So there have been uh, pressure transducers be invented in that scale which was necessary. And uh, finally, um, there was also important um, uh, uh, literature on that case from other sources about uh, the um, roughness Reynolds number. It was, and the roughness Reynolds number was identified as the, as the decisive parameter here. I would like to uh, encourage all colleagues also to go after monitoring. 
it is especially difficult for uh, wind turbines, of course, because there we have this moving part, the large moving part of the blades, which cannot be grasped at all in the moment uh, regarding their deformation. But uh, a lot of monitoring strategies are ongoing, especially on uh, wind turbines, as that is um, sometimes a rule for the uh, um, uh, certification of the uh, wind turbine. It needs monitoring. And from that monitoring data, we can profit a lot for our experiments. Yeah, this is very good. The only problem that we have very shortly is that uh, sometimes it's very difficult and very expensive to do this uh, field measurements or because of the particular circumstances of the experiment, these are not really feasible. So the question remains, what do we do if we do not have full-scale data? Marina. So, um, oh, I'm Marina Neofitu from University of Cyprus. I just wanted to bring to our attention uh, with regard to the geometric scaling, that geometric scaling does not stand by itself. Of course, apart from the special resolution, we would like to resolve the, the detail with which we would like to resolve our problem. There is also the dynamic scaling, so it's important uh, to be aware that that geometric scaling is part also of of and dynamical scaling in our wind tunnel testing. So depending on the spatial scales and then dynamics, heat, or just dynamics, uh, fluid dynamics itself, uh, and what we would like to resolve, turbulent scales, uh, turbulent boundary length scales, and so forth. So it's part of that. So it's not completely independent and self-standing. So that was just my comment. Thank you for your comment. You. Any other input to that question? Yes. <laughs> it's a very unique way of transferring the It should mic. be a rugby ball instead. <laughs> so uh, my, my question or comment is the uh, following. I was very delighted to see the presentation by Professor De, De Ville. Yeah, it's correct name, uh, on the thermal stratification. And I, I would like to stress the importance of the scaling in thermal stratification and in the wind tunnel. Because uh, in, a, in a wind tunnel, it's the, what is important in scaling? We, we didn't see uh, one scale ratio. This is Richard's number. And this is something which is very difficult to, to scale and to make appropriate in the wind tunnel. Because a, uh, there are there is a thermal differences, and this, uh, this is also wind velocity very important in this scale. So this is, uh, in my opinion, very difficult. A part of the measurement of the, of the wind scale when there is a trend, uh, thermal stratification in wind tunnel. So I just raise this question or to have a comment maybe in the later discussion on that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any reaction or any further comment? Yes, Alan. Well, addressing your point and making and asking one question at the same time, we have a wind tunnel that you can produce stratified flow in. Um, so you're faced with a problem that if you're setting up a standard boundary layer, a neutral flow, there are two methods, well, maybe just one now, that you take from the literature, well established, you can use it, or inspire type of method. When it comes to doing stratified flow, you now can alter the temperature profile in the inlet flow. You can heat and cool the surface. There are a lot more parameters to work with. There is no standard method to use. So you have to develop your own methods, which is what we've been gradually doing in the context of offshore um, wind powers. So North Sea, where there's always a temperature difference between the water and the air. Um, and we've been gradually extending. But really, I suppose what we're looking at primarily initially is getting the ratio of boundary layer height to modern Bukov length scale and looking at that as our bulk parameter to judge what we're doing. And then we'd look in more detail at the flow structure. And there's a whole series of papers that Phil Hancock and his colleagues have been writing about that. But it's, it's a very difficult thing to do properly. And there's actually, when you say, I would like to model a, a stable boundary layer in the North Sea, what shall I compare my results with? There's really nothing. So you're, you're in a very open field. Um, and the question I wanted to ask is, is, when I started doing dispersion studies for a commercial organization, we used models that were extremely detailed. And when we said, why are they so detailed? The answer was nothing to do with aerodynamics. It was, 
when people come to look at them, they cannot ask, why have you left that out? Because you haven't. Um, now we're in a university, we can't afford that. So the models we actually use are very simple. And very often they're just cuboids. So the question is, how much detail do we need to include on those models if we're trying to study, say, dispersion in street canyons at the, at the neighborhood <laughs> scale? And we produce, in line with what a, one of the speakers just uh, mentioned earlier, we use very simple models because primarily we're producing data not to solve practical problems, but to judge how well models can re reproduce what we measure. So actually having a simple model is, is helpful in that respect. Thank you. Yeah. Life, as you say. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to comment on, uh, on this. Uh, indeed, I, I fully agree that uh, the scaling is, is far from trivial uh, if you include stratification. Uh, on top of that, if you look on, on wind turbines over land, they will also suffer or profit from uh, low-level jets. And low-level jets arise due, due to an uh, imbalance of forces due to Coriolis effects. So it would be extremely harsh to make that in a, in a, in a wind tunnel uh, uh, in spite of its relevance. Eh? So that's why I advocated also, like, you can use wind tunnels for specific questions uh, really to address those. Uh, same as for other tools, but you need, uh, in the end, uh, a cocktail of, of tools to, to really tackle your problem, because uh, one of those will not be superior to the others. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, one comment, and following what uh, Alberto Sassou has been telling, that each topic has to, to match with one modeling. Uh, the modeling has to be specially fitted to the question that is asked. Um, there is something concerning the, the wind loads that we have been to be very careful with, is the time scaling. Usually, most of us, when we are designing wind loads, that is a stochastic process, we are making something like equivalent of two hours of full-scale measurements. And in some cases, and I think that uh, Vincent de Noël will not say anything else, <laughs> we are too short in measuring this time. And when you, you want to address the question of the extreme loads, you look for peaks, you have to make very long measurements, even in, in wind tunnel. And so most of the time, I think we are making too short measurements. Right. Well, we have length scales, we have time scales, we have velocity scales. I mean, there are, it's a multi-scaling I mean, you know, phenomenon. But what I, I heard so far is that each case is different. The scaling is important, and the scaling has to be justified. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, anybody else? Okay, yes. Well, thank you. I'm uh, Jay Marshall from ANSYS, one of the, the CFD uh, the developer. And I like very much many comments that have been made here. This one-to-one -one scale that uh, Dr. Gertz was mentioning is a very good comment. We've got enough uh, landscape and uh, nice building where we can make some measurement and we can challenge the wind tunnel and uh, the CFD code in order to, uh, to reproduce that. Just like what we are doing in the automotive industry, aeronautic industry, and the healthcare industry. Why don't we de uh, define some kind of challenge and ask every uh, wind tunnel analysis and every uh, CFD uh, software to, uh, to mo model that? And along this line, coming from the industry, one of the strong comments that are, are, or requests that I would have from you is that quite often I'm hearing some people to say, okay, when should I use the wind tunnel? When should I use the CFDI analysis? And I'm getting a little bit tired to defend the wind tunnel analysis in front of CFD lovers and the CFD uh, approach in front of the, the wind tunnel uh, skeptical people. Can you define this kind of best rule? And maybe it's available uh, right now uh, somewhere on the web. On the web. <coughs> but can you define some uh, guidance about when do we need to use which one? What is the best approach? And I've heard some very good comments today. OK, it's very interesting from uh, uh, Professor de, de Noel uh, to do the uh, scaling. CFD analysis can help us to do that. To do the post-processing, I've heard that uh, CFD can help us. On the other hand, it's extremely important to, to validate any kind of CFD model through a wind tunnel. So both of them are important over there. So it would be extremely important if all this very nice panel 
could co-author some document giving some guidelines to, uh, to the industry. Thank you. I knew that this question would come up. The only thing is that, of course, it's a very important uh, topic. I hesitate to put it out of order, but basically what, what happens here is we're talking about wind tunnel techniques as such. But what we said, I think what you said is absolutely right. It would be nice to have the answer to that question. I don't think we do yet. But in any case, anybody would like to comment on that? Vincent, you don't want to comment? Anybody else here? Okay. Um, yeah, since, I, since I, I was talking about guidelines, um, actually I do not have so much experience with CFD, but w what I see is that uh, if you go to conferences, if you see results, sometimes if you discuss with people that have done CFD work, is that it's still very hard to find, particularly if you look into loads on buildings and then in particularly local loads on buildings, to find CFD models which actually give you the right answer. So the right answer which means that you have uh, uh, validation with internal work or validation even with full-scale work. So there's really uh, still work to do if you go to the, to the, to the modeling uh, side in, in CFD world. And I strongly believe that wind tunnels, good quality wind tunnels will, have a, will play a very, very big role in that. If we don't use wind tunnels, I, I think maybe that's another statement. We are not even able to uh, to get CF, to to find CFD models which accurately predict wind loads. So we really need those wind tunnels for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see some other people first, and then uh, I'll ask you as well. Okay, the cube. <laughs> My turn to get the cube. So uh, Hervé Kosmar, uh, University of Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, several issues were, were brought up uh, here, so uh, geometric scaling, thermal certification, complex terrain, uh, street canyons. Uh, it's, it's my personal impression that uh, answers to some of these questions are already out there in uh, other communities. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, we are doing uh, wind engineering. And there is a geophysics and meteorology uh, community. And then uh, we see in uh, our literature, uh, it's my opinion that the links are too weak at the moment. For example, in our journal, uh, you see so little references to monthly weather review, to journal of uh, geophysical uh, research, to quarterly journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, and the others. So uh, just a comment that perhaps uh, it would be possible to uh, come forward uh, much quicker in our research in case uh, the efforts would be stronger with uh, other communi communities. So, for example, uh, these days, uh, wildfires in uh, California, uh, wind and fire and those things, I think, could be uh, addressed uh, much more uh, effective in, in, in uh, working together with, with uh, other communities. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was another comment or question there, yes. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Li from Hulan University of Science and Technology in China. Uh, you know that there's a wind tunnel in my university and uh, when I uh, doing my PhD degree research and I conduct many wind tunnel te tests for buildings, structures and uh, bridges and that's the question made me confused, that is the blockage effect, you know that? Just like you just uh, say, uh, said that the scaling of the buildings is very important. You know that in China, there are many tall buildings, although all the super tall buildings, maybe 500 meters higher. So the scaling is very important. But if you make the scaling uh, more, more small to close to the uh, first scale building, so you will, um, meet with the problem of the blockage effect. So I, wa I wonder how can we do to improve the wind tunnel test results or to avoid the blockage effect in the wind tunnel? Oh, that's my question. Thank you. Yes, blockage is very important, I agree. All right, uh, Alberto, let's see the last thing on scaling so that we can address some other topics as well. <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> 
So I perfectly agree about the, full, the to go to full scale, of course. But first of all, let's stay on the wind tunnel. And so uh, the effort that we are doing uh, in Milano is to have in our hands uh, the numerical modeling of the flow. So to do the numerical experiment uh, together with the experimental experiment uh, to make a large eddy simulation of the flow, to know exactly the flow that we are doing in the wind tunnel, in the meanwhile we are doing the experiment, and to try to make the numerical simulation and of the experiment. It is extremely difficult. I, I mean that uh, for to, 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 to figure out the peaks that we are measuring on a building, uh, on a very simple geometrical size of build, of ge geometrical shape of building, to be, to, to be sure that we are able to simulate those peaks numerically and to know exactly we, we, what is going on experimentally, it is something that still is not very uh, well known. We are trying to do that uh, in uh, different scales. Uh, in, uh, we are doubling the experiment we are doing in Milano in the wall of wind, uh, going to a higher Reynolds number again, and to do this uh, both numerically and experimentally. This will help in order to give the answer to in which way to use the numbers that we are using, measuring in the wind tunnel in order to, f to feed the codes and to, f and to do the right numbers to the designers. Still, this is not, in my opinion, uh, very well known concerning the peak loads on the buildings. Okay, thank you. Now let's go to any of the other questions as they were posed by the panelists. Who would like to address any of these questions? Yes. You want to throw the over there? You? Yeah. <laughs> Who was asking? So no one is asking. You want to you want to talk or no? Okay, sorry, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. I just want to make a comment to the challenges, uh, uh, somebody said uh, up there. Uh, is it n not true that the wind tunnel can add also a lot when uh, geometry is extremely complex? Eh? So, um, I'm a, I'm a hydrologist from origin, so we know the law of hagen Poisson. It's, it's that easy. You, you learn it even from analytics. I learned it from that guy. But still we cannot see how water flows through a soil because the boundary conditions are not known. It's completely irregular. Well, the same if, if you have your cycling team eh, uh, and they're really moving and they're changing and they have a soft tissue and different clothing, how would you do that in a model, right? So I think that the same is true for vegetation, true vegetation, that would be very difficult to model in, 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 in uh, using, uh, yeah, maybe that guy in the back can, can do something, <laughs> but, um, but I would see that as a challenge, that uh, real difficult boundary conditions uh, that are still very much challenging to, to CFD. Uh, maybe you can co comment on that. Maybe the chair, uh, the chair of today. Okay. Anybody who would like to address this issue? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. My name's uh, Jean-Paul Ballard from Swiss Side Cycling, and you just mentioned cycling, so I thought I might uh, have a small input there. Um, I completely agree with you, and we use a lot of CFD, a lot of wind tunnel testing, but then also a lot of real world testing. And I think that's the key here. We need, uh, I know nothing about buildings and building aerodynamics, by the way, but I do know a lot about cycling aerodynamics. And I think the, the key thing I've learned there is, well, we have the benefit of one-to-one -one scales, but we still have a lot of uh, Reynolds effects. And like you say, a lot of changing situations, a rider is a dynamic system. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in CFD, for example, model, modeling multiple configurations, multiple leg positions, multiple body positions. But then, of course, it's just a CFD simulation. And as, as well, we don't really get the, the, the boundary layer transition effects like we, we need, so we have to go to the wind tunnel. Then in the wind tunnel, we can also test in a dynamic way. But the wind tunnel is, again, just another simulation. We need the real-world effects of the rider actually moving uh, on the bike. So we then spend a lot of time doing real-world modeling um, with various sensors on the bike, um, aerodynamic measurements, both physical position measurements and whatever. And from my experience in, say, the cycling world, the key is it comes back that we need all three. We need the CFD, we need the wind tunnel to verify the CFD measurements, 
and then we need the real world measurements to close the loop all around. So from what I've heard today, I think the most important thing is to do again, once again, those uh, real world measurements to tie into the, res to the research and to the experimental testing. Okay, thank you. Any other comment or question on the main questions, either from the panelists or from the audience? Yes. <laughs> well, I have the loud voice. I can do it <laughs> From 1972 onwards, we have measurements of wind, very good measurements of wind profiles and uh, simultaneously is temperature with a 200 meter mast in the Netherlands. And I wonder whether the community has these data at their desk, and I hear discussions on the effect of low level yet. Once long a time I discussed it and showed it the low level yet to many people who were interested and visited. So if you are not have not that data on your desk and you want it, please address the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute. It is still there. Thank you. Well, that's a very good uh, point. I'm not sure how many people know about this data, that uh, valid data, useful data. Um. Thanks to this data, the uh, models, meteorological models, Oops. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thanks to this uh, data, actually, these uh, meteorological models are very good onshore, but offshore is very poor. So please put a mast offshore, and we will also <laughs> <laughs> improve it there. Here we go. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting point. Just also answering that, um, today's requirement is not for 200 meters high, but uh, we have some questions for super tall buildings. You know, there is one being constructed now that is uh, 1,000 meter high, and there is a need for that uh, up to 300 meters. And the big question today is more on this. I mean, uh, for the super tall buildings, we know quite nothing about the, the wind upon 500 meters. So we are making assumptions today. Okay, thank you. Really good. I'd like to add up to that remark. Ah, yes. Um, we know about your data, of course, especially also uh, regarding the um, validation of the data measured by Professor Pyle with a 341 meter. We discussed a lot about that. You remember and we got a lot of very important um, uh, indications from this 200 meter mass. Apart from that, also for offshore, there is something. The Fino platform is working quite well and we are using that in, in every direction. But at the end, um, I think our work, as, at least as far as building aerodynamics is concerned, but I think also other uh, branches, is that we need robust solutions. One reason for robust solutions is that we don't know what comes in future. There was a PT on climate change, just finished uh, its work last year. Uh, I was a member of this PT and I found out that the meteorologists are really very, very deeply involved into scenarios, modeling with um, massive computing. And uh, they have some results which uh, bring us to the um, br could bring us to, uh, to new ideas about uh, robust modeling. For example, in the moment it's quite clear there is no statistical significant um, um, indication about the need to change 50 years values, at least in Europe, in Middle Europe. There is no indication about that. In Norway, it seems to be a little bit different. Uh, so, for example, our colleague Svein Ficke was working on that, a meteorologist, and they found out that there obviously um, can be already today measured a change. So we need to reflect that uh, with respect to our codes. And uh, regarding the wind tunnel, it will not touch us in the moment. Maybe apart from um, new directions, there is in, in Poland, also in Great Britain, a move to go in direction of uh, um, thermal effects, thermal effects on, on wind loading on structures. So this could be also an interesting direction. Okay, good point. Any other comment or uh, question on these issues? Yes. 
Uh, yeah, maybe I had a comment, uh, which is kind of a general comment, and pa partly could answer uh, Keith's question uh, according to how to analyze the data. And uh, I was expecting that we would touch the question of uh, how do we process the data. Okay. And I think this is very important. Uh, we are usually not clear enough on how we report the data. Olivier said we do not measure long enough, we should measure much longer. Uh, we design buildings based on peak pressures and they are usually determined based on too short measurements or um, too short simulations. Right? To make it shorter, the difference between CFD or complementarity between CFD and, and wind tunnel testing, which was the question raised before, is that of course they are complementary. Uh, and the best proof is that just by, by definition, Becht is a clever guy. <laughs> So he's very good at CFD, so if he's installing now a wind tunnel here, is that because it's needed, right? So you need both. Um, and uh, so coming back to data processing, uh, how can we process the data in the right way? I have no answer to the question, of course, uh, but I'm sure if I ask a question to every single people in the room, uh, whatever you do, so CFD, wind tunnel, uh, or just a design based on models, uh, you would believe that what you do is great, maybe it's good, and uh, usually what I can say is that this is too often based on uh, uh, descriptive statistics. So it means that we are good at computing mean, standard deviation, autocorrelation, et cetera, et cetera. But what we usually, usually what we forget is that actually what we have computed as a CFD or what we have observed in the wind tunnel is just one realization of a, which is just extracted from a random process and is just a, somehow a visualization of, of a whole population and what we, need to, what we need to use to design is the properties of that population. So, so please use uh, inferential statistics. And this will tell you for how long you need to compute, for how long you need to measure, how accurate you need to measure the spatial resolution of the sensors, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess inferential statistics should be used much more. Yeah, I guess, well, one of the difficulties with what you're saying is that depends on the type of test or the type of experiment, what we want to find. So it's not just... Uh, one answer fits all, you know, because for different type of tests, of course, you have different uh, analysis. That's why it's difficult, I think, to generalize that. But uh, anybody who'd like to make a comment on that or? Yes, go ahead. Um, I think adding to your comment that it depends on the situation you're actually measuring is that um, if you look into wind loads, the part I was talking about, Olivier was talking about, is that especially if you talk about buildings which have to be designed, we are not actually looking for the truth. We are not looking for the right answer. In the end, it's always a compromise between being safe enough, being to some extent economic. So uh, having some conservatism in your modeling, including the processing of the data and analysis of the data, is accepted there. I think there are some other fields which it's, this becomes more, how you say that, becomes more stricter than that, but especially when you look into the wind loads we accept some conservatism. It's also related to the way you process the data, but we can discuss about that, I think, later. Um, you can sometimes make cho choices which give you a more economic wind tunnel test and give you sufficient safety for the end user. Okay, thank you. Any other point on those? Well, there were a couple of questions that I think we haven't at least explicitly uh, touched upon. One was the question that uh, Alan Robb has posed about whether the future is for, uh, for unmanned operation, automatic or robotic, if you like, because now we have robots that they perform operations on people, right? So are we going to have robots to perform wind tunnel experiments and we're going to have remote control, etc., etc.? Anybody who would like to make any comment on that? I personally see no reason why, but we're not there yet. But, uh, uh, you know. When you do that to people, why not you do that to models, right? <laughs> okay, no, but okay, yes, Sasa. Well, I, I don't know how, because the, the, setting, the setting of the wind tunnel testing is the, is the most time cons expensive. So you take, uh, for, for example, one week or two weeks to set up the, the test case and the experiment itself, it takes one or two days. So the, the, the automatic thing will be for one or two days, but what about the time before you do the, the test itself? When we do it at VKI, uh, we have to stop because uh, the wind tunnel was making so much noise that the neighbors complained. So I hope that the TU wind tunnel is <laughs> doesn't have this problem. Right. Um, 
all I would say is that, of course, that control system has got to build in all the, all the, uh, all the calibration routines, all the background checks. Everything you would do if you were there has now to be done automatically. Uh, and that at the right rate. And, and in some ways, it's a good discipline because the software can actually say, you know, you, you should do a calibration at this point. Don't carry on. <laughs> or the background has changed too much. So you can build a lot into it. Um, then you get a first set. So in, in part of that uh, operational software, there would be a data visualizer. So you can actually see the data, map it out raw. And then you're always going to do post-processing anyway, maybe just to take drift out or something. But you, you just have to make sure that you are monitoring everything that you would note if you were running the experiment. And that includes what else is going on in the lab. So that the metadata is comprehensive. Because if you're not there, the only way of finding out what, why it went wrong is to look at that metadata sometimes. Okay, thank you. Um, one maybe last point, and uh, this is, uh, well, we talked about stratification and we talked about thermal effects on uh, wind loads perhaps, but what we did not talk about is thermal effects on pedestrian level winds, and that's exactly the topic that uh, Eddie kind of, you know, uh, brought up. Not the thermal effects, the actual uh, guidelines, I mean, you know, for pedestrian level winds, which I believe that they're very, very good, what uh, Netherlands has right now. The only criticism, if you like, on these guidelines is that they do not, of course, include anything that the wind-induced force on people rather than, than uh, uh, other climatic factors like uh, thermal rain and things like this. Um, do you have any comment to make on that? Well, the, uh, the standard, the Dutch standard, uh, was based uh, upon uh, uh, the, uh, the way they were doing those kind of assessment in, in those days, where different parties in the Netherlands came to different results uh, for the same uh, problem. And that's what we wanted we, uh, to uh, obtain. We didn't want to have knobs where you could turn and get your result uh, fine-tuned or uh, not fine-tuned. But uh, that means uh, we should... Uh, um, we, co we could not solve that problem. Okay. Uh, it's still open. Uh, I think it's very uh, difficult. Uh, I don't see how you could adapt, uh, how you could incorporate it in that standard. So it would be a an, uh, an big modification. Um, but maybe you should try to reach uh, some kind of improvement. So it would help, I think. Okay, well, thank you. I think one thing that's very certain based on this discussion is how many different topics for future PhD theses are available. <laughs> So that's, I think, quite uh, challenging. And unless there is any other pressing question, we're already five minutes into the coffee break, so, but we started a bit late. So if, uh, if that's the case, I would like to thank the panelists, to thank the audience for the participation. And uh, let's have a good coffee break. <laughs>